Bishop Henry, elders of Sasu in his community, ladies and gentlemen, organizers, organizers of this occasion tonight. I want to begin by expressing my deepest gratitude to each and every one of you for having taken upon yourself and upon yourselves uh, a burden of giving up many important activities in your family, in your life, to come here and listen to me. It's a special privilege, it's a special honor to me as your son, as one of your leaders, as one of your compatriots, and it is indeed important to all of us that we have gathered here tonight to share some important highlights about the direction that our country has taken since the 15th of December 2013. As I was listening to you, when you were, when you were making your short speeches, especially uh, a few number of you who have been availed an opportunity to make remarks, it goes without saying that the plea of our people for peace and unity is loud and clear. And it also goes without saying that we are densely divided as people. I have not come to take notice of that here today, but wherever I have met South Sudanese, whether in Chuba or here, we are a densely divided society. And the very fact that our country is now embroiled in violence is a clear testament, is a clear indication that our society is densely divided. And therefore, the first premise to start is exactly that. What we ought to address first tonight is conflict itself. Because I will be remiss if I talk about the future without making few analysis about this conflict and how to avoid it in the future. And so I will beg you to bear with me as I take you along this story some obvious facts that you have heard time and again from many of our politicians that have spoken on those issues, on those same issues. As I said, on the 15th of December 2013, our country plunged into its deepest crisis when a shootout broke out in our capital in Chuba in that Sunday night. Some of you were there, some of you who were not even there were concerned and followed up very closely on this heartbreaking episode that South Sudan should have not witnessed at all. But it is important that we understand why are we in this miserable state of affairs. In my view, I would say 
that this conflict has many root causes to it. Some of these root causes might be social, might be historical because of the long war between us and Fantu, and a number of unattended conflicts in our community. It might be cultural because you are not only talking about the conflict that broke out on the 15th of December 2015, 2013. Prior to the outbreak of hostilities in Juba in the night of 15th December 2013, South Sudan was already in conflict with itself. There were many conflicts going on in South Sudan. Some you may call them inter-communal, inter-communal, inter-ethnic uh, conflicts. Some you may call them conflicts even within the same ethnic community. And our conflicts with have too. And limited rebel activities against the government. So that has been South Sudan. South Sudan all along even though we signed peace in 2005 and had our vote for independence in 2011, we did not enjoy peace. We were not out of the woods. We have always been in the woods. We have always been in conflict. And this conflict, as I said, has so many layers. This should not, by any means, underrate the fact that political contestations, the issues of politics, power struggle, or reforms, or change within the ruling party, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, SPLM, acted as a trigger for this explosive situation to come to where it is now. And I will talk about it shortly. So what happened after the events? Different political groupings within the ruling party and in the government and different observers and analysts who follow South Sudan came up with, with different definitions of what actually happened in that night of 15 December 2013. On the government side, it was characterized, or you may say it was mischaracterized as a coup d'etat, as an attempted coup. Many observers, as I said, including all the embassies, all the foreign embassies in Cuba, the United Nations Mission for South Sudan, the African Union, the neighboring countries, and of late, of course, President Yoweri Museveni is on record about his understanding of those events, that there was no attempted coup in Cuba, but what actually happened was a mutiny. So that is one theory. What is important here are the dynamics and the consequences that December 15th, 2013 generated. On the morning of the 16th December, 11 of us, and actually more than 11 of us, because Peter Adwok was also taken in with us. And when uh, the, uh, 
when the special envoy visited and also when President Uhuru Kenyatta and Prime Minister Hela Maria Salich of Ethiopia visited us in detention. They were appalled by the fact that a veteran of liberation is struggling who actually lost his leg. And it can tell you the extent of sacrifice that we made, you know, during the days of the struggle. If a PhD in geology, a university lecturer, could take Leishenkov, went to the front line to face the enemy and he was shot in his leg, that led to, 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 uh, to that amputation. It became a shame on us and a shame on South Sudan that Peter Rebok was arrested, let alone the fact that the very people who fought for this country to be free, all of them, people that you may call your heroes, they were rounded up and sent into jail as traitors on the, on, 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 uh, on the morning of 16th December. And Peter and Rome was one of them. So everybody complained and Peter and Rome was sent to his house on house arrest. And the rest of the story you know. So the number of these people was more than than, uh, than 11 that we all always talk about because others were rounded up and then left. Uh, people like Peter Rigo uh, were sent to, 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 to their homes uh, on, on a house arrest. So this, this is one consequence of December 15th. Another consequence of December 15th is that Dr. Ryo Mechal, the guy, left Juba, I think around the 18th, because we were already uh, incarcerated, and took in the direction of Dongle State. On the 19th of December, While following the news, we learned that Dr. Ria Mecha, Raban Dengai, had declared rebellion against the government of Saskia. And then the rest of it was that this situation spread very quickly to engulf all the three states of Upper Nile. There was an outbreak of fighting in Gore. Shortly thereafter, there was an outbreak of fighting in Malacca. And there was an outbreak of fighting in Benchim. Part of the dynamics that this situation generated was that there was door-to-door -door search in Juba of ethnic Nuers and ethnic Nuers were targeted and killed in Juba. A few days later, Innocent Dinkers, working as part of the government of South Sudan and part of the government of Jongle State in a Kobo, were attacked in the UN camp and they were slaughtered, all of them. None of them survived. Very innocent people, like innocent people who were slaughtered in Juba between the 16th to 19th of December. Very innocent people who had nothing to do with conflict at all were responded in a Congo. The war spread 
to God, to Manaka, and Betiwa, as I said. with serious violations of human rights, with war crimes being committed and crimes against humanity. People were killed, women were raped, civilians were abused, people were sent on wholesale displacement. And a number of our citizens ended up in what we now call as UN protection camps. So, very many South, Sudan, South Sudanese ran to the UN protection camp in Cuba, running away from their own brothers and sisters to seek protection. The same happened in Gold, the same happened in Malacca, and the same thing happened in Beijing. So South Sudan, because of our own acts as South Sudanese, we ended up reproducing their food in our own country. And when I was working in the National Security Service, and I used to visit Niada, and, uh, and my fashion, Jinena, and always coming across this kind of camps where civilians are taking refuge in the UN camps in their own country. I was always uh, being hard on my colleagues in the national security that this is not the kind of Sudan we should we should belong to. We should we should belong else, somewhere else, but not to this country that is treating its citizens the way this government is doing. Unfortunately I was proven wrong that this could happen in South Sudan, a country we fought for, a country we sacrificed Normally, to make free. And the rest of it is that the country was divided and the country was caught up in a civil war. This is the picture in our country. I want to underscore one important point here that if the international community did not act with foresight looking forward in 2011 to extend the mandate of United Nations mission in South Sudan, and if the international community, including the regional body IGAD and the African Union, did not act decisively to move to South Sudan after the outbreak of crisis. Don't tell me that South Sudanese were not going for genocide. It was very clear that South Sudanese had so much, so much animosity among themselves, so much hate in their hearts, and nothing short of mass slaughter, nothing short of genocide, nothing short of decimating your brother or your sister was going to happen. Because that little thing that we did was the tip of the iceberg. And it tells a lot about the direction of things in South Sudan. Where actually did we want to take our country? But thank God, the UN was there, so those poor souls we still see today walking around in the camps for displaced people was because of the UN. These poor civilians you see in places like Awaria, 